So it's time for the next talk. Our speaker, Dr. Connor Meredith, from the University of Colorado. Well, thank you to everyone for attending my talk, and especially thank you to the conference organizers for giving me the chance to talk. Um, today we're going to be talking about no potence localization and dualizability. Really, this is a dualizability talk that uses no potence and localization makes an appearance. Um, I wanted to start off by talking about a few examples of dualities that motivate the sort of dualizability um, we're interested in because there are a million different types of duality. Um, so probably the, the key example we want to keep in our head is that of Pontryagin duality, um, which tells us that the category of Debelian groups with group homomorphisms is dually equivalent to the category of um, compact Hausdorff Debelian groups with continuous group homomorphisms. Um, the objects in these categories have a very uh, special form. Um, every abelian group is isomorphic to a subgroup of a power of the circle group, and every compact abelian group is isomorphic to a closed substructure of a power over non empty index set of the topological circle. Um, the other thing I want to emphasize about this duality is that the functors also take a particular form. Um, given an abelian group D, uh, we'll map D to its um, space of characters over the circle group. Um, given a compact uh, abelian group, uh, we'll map it to its algebra of characters over the topological circle. Um, this isn't the only duality that takes this form. Um, we also have stone duality, um, which is very similar. It gives us a dual equivalence between the category of Boolean algebras and the category of stone spaces. Um, once again, our objects are given by pre-varieties. Our functors are both representable. Um, they're, they're both on functors given spaces of characters. Um, and the question is, what is so special about the circle group that lets it serve this role? What is so special about the two-element Boolean algebra that lets it serve this role? Um, which, which other algebras can serve as a character object for a duality? Um, so that leads to this definition. Um, we'll start with the finite algebra. Um, we first want to nail down um, what sort of companion comes with one of these special algebras. Um, you'll notice the circle group and topological cir circle group have the same underlying set. Um, the two element Boolean algebra and the two element stone space have the same underlying set. Um, we can view these things as, as pairs of structures on the same set. So given a finite algebra A, um, we say an alter ego of A is a structure that has the same underlying set that is equipped with the discrete topology, um, some set of relations, and some set of operations, subject to some compatibility conditions that we really don't need to focus on for this talk. Um, we'll say an algebra is dualizable if there is a choice of alter ego, so that we do actually get a dual representation like we see in Stone duality or Montreagin duality. Now, dualizability is still a fairly uh, mysterious property. Um, we do have a characterization of dualizability um, in, a, in a rather limited setting, um, specifically in the setting of congruence distributive varieties. Um, dualizability can be determined by the presence or absence of a certain type of term operation. Um, so specifically, um, in the congruence distributed setting, dualizability is equivalent to the presence of something called a near unity term operation. Um, so, for example, um, 
the two element Boolean algebra has such an operation, so it's dualizable, or just by Stone duality, it's dualizable. Um, but the two element implication algebra does not have such a term operation, yet belongs to a congruence distributed variety, so it is non dualizable. Um, moving to broader settings, we suddenly lose this nice characterization of dualizability. Um, it's known that the symmetric group on three letters is dualizable, yet if you expand the symmetric group by its constant operations, suddenly it's non-dualizable. Um, so dualizability cannot be characterized by a multisive condition in this setting, um, because if it were, well, S3 would have to have certain term operations, the expansion by constant would have those same operations. So what do we know about um, this transition from our nice distributive setting um, to this modular setting? Well, the way I like to view the transition from congruence distributive to congruence modular is um, a transition in commutator behavior. Um, so this is the same commutator um, we're looking at in the tutorial talks. Um, we know that if an algebra generates a congruence distributive variety, then the commutator is neutral throughout, throughout the variety. Um, we know any commutator has to be at least below um, the meet, and in fact, in congruence distributive varieties, it is exactly equal. Oh, sorry. All right, cool. Yeah, so in, in the CD case, the commutator is neutral. When you transition to a congruence modular variety, though, you suddenly get commutators that are lower than the meet. Um, so we can see this um, not just as a transition in um, the congruence lattices of our algebras, but in fact, we can see it as an introduction of abelian intervals. Um, in our algorithms class. All right, so a few examples um, of what we do know about dualizability in the congruence modular setting. Um, first of all, if you have an algebra that generates a congruence modular variety um, whose commutator is neutral, it turns out that your variety is just distributive again. Um, and we have our, our multi characterization that we already looked at. Um, on the other extreme, instead of the commutator being as large as possible, um, we can also look at when the commutator is as small as possible. So when we're dealing with abelian algebras, um, it turns out that any abelian algebra is dualizable. And there are things in between. Um, there's a property called neutrabelianness. It's some type of blending between neutral commutator behavior and abelian commutator behavior. Um, and it turns out that in that setting, dualizability is at least implied by a Maltzeff condition. So we do know a fair amount um, when the commutator behaves in an abelian way, or at least in a partially abelian way. Um, Something that is still rather mysterious, though, is what happens when um, you have non-abelian solvable congruences. Um, so what happens when the commutator um, isn't immediately zero, but zero after some number of steps? Um, to answer this question, we need to know what solvability even is. And it turns out that there is not just a single notion of sol solvability. There's not just a single notion of nilpotence um, for general algebras. So I want to talk a little bit about the definition of the higher commutator. Um, I know we have our, our pair of tutorial talks on this, but um, I have some diagrams that I'm very proud of and couldn't bring myself to let them go. So. <laughs> 
Uh, we'll not focus too much on this, but it's, it's a three-stage definition. Um, I'll just outline how we define a, a three-area calculator. Um, so we start with congruences alpha-1, alpha-2, and alpha-3. Um, we're going to define something called an alpha-1, alpha-2, alpha-3 matrix. Um, so such matrix will be an element of um, A to the power H of a certain form. Um, to obtain an alpha matrix, you start with the term operation for your algebra um, and a partition of its area into N1, N2, and N3. And you take tuples that are coordinate wise alpha 1 or alpha 2 or alpha 3 related. Um, and you form an alpha matrix out of this information. The way you do this is your first entry of your alpha matrix will be just T of A1, A2, A3. And to get other entries of your matrix, you allow these inputs to shift along alpha 1 or alpha 2 or alpha 3 to the corresponding B values. So for example, we might shift our first input from our A1 tuple to a B1 tuple. That gives us something alpha 1 related. Um, we can also shift our second input um, or third input or any combination of shifts. So overall, we end up with a cube of um, elements of our algebra. Um, and the definition of the higher commutator will have n hypercubes instead of just regular cubes. That kind of explains why I said 2 cubed instead of just 8 here. I'm trying to emphasize that an n airy commutator will um, be given by elements of a to the 2 to the n. Okay, so what do we actually do with these objects? Um, we can use them to define a centralization relation. So given three congruences, alpha and a congruence delta, um, we'll say that alpha 1 and alpha 2 centralize alpha 3 modulo delta if a following condition on alpha matrices holds. Um, the condition is that for any alpha matrix, if certain pairs in the matrix are delta related, then um, another pair is delta related. Um, there will always be at least one delta satisfying this, namely the meet of alpha 1, alpha 2, and alpha 3 will satisfy this. Um, and if you take meets of satisfactory deltas, then you get another satisfactory delta. Um, so it makes sense to talk about the least such delta that satisfies this condition. Um, and that's exactly what our commutator of alpha 1, alpha 2, and alpha 3 um, higher commutators are defined um, completely analogously. Um, we could go through this, but I'll just say, instead of saying 3 in your head, say N in your head. Okay, so, yeah, we, we have some notion of the commutator. Um, and from this, we can describe um, no potence in two possible ways. Um, so start with the congruence alpha. Um, one notion of no potence comes from the iterated binary commutator. Um, we can repeatedly bracket um, A with itself more and more times. Um, we've seen this notion of no potence or, or this descending sequence of commutators in groups. Um, but we also have this second commutator available to us, this um, higher area commutator. Um, so instead of just repeatedly using our binary commutator to define a, a sequence of congruences, we can instead just use higher and higher arities of commutator. Now, if this first sequence of congruences um, reaches zero, we'll say alpha is no potent. If this sequence reaches zero, we'll say alpha is super no potent. Um, there's no general implication between no potence and super no potence. 
Um, but what is true is for finite algebras, super nilpotence implies nilpotence. Um, since we're interested in dualizability, um, we're only really interested in finite algebras, so you can probably safely think of super nilpotence as a strong form of nilpotence. Okay, so I promised this would have something to do with dualizability. Um, and we do have a result from Vincent Meyer. Um, given a finite notebook in algebra A in a congruence modular variety, if A has a non abelian super notebook in congruence, then A is non dualizable. So somehow, non abelian super notebook is a barrier to dualizability. Um, a natural question is to ask if that is the only barrier for finite nilpotent algebras. Um, so are the following equivalent for any finite nilpotent algebra A? One is dualizable. Two, for every algebra B and ISP of A, every super nilpotent congruence of B is abelian. So another way to look at this theorem from Vincent Meyer, or a, a more limited way to look at it, is to recognize that for an algebra, finite algebra, finite type, um, super nilpotence is equivalence, equivalent to the existence of a prime power direct decomposition. Um, so in particular, we have this result. If A is a finite nilpotent algebra, a finite type in a congruence modular variety, and A is not abelian in prime power order, then A is inherently non dualizable. So there is at least a size restriction on um, dualizable nilpotent algebras finite type. It turns out that that is the only restriction on the sizes of such algebras. Um, we found that um, if you take any size that is not a prime power, then there does actually exist a nilpotent non-abelian dualizable algebra of that size. Um, something else we found was that um, on this previous slide, we asked if the absence of super nilpotent non abelian congruences um, in a certain class was enough to guarantee dualizability. It turns out that it's not. Um, so we also found that there is a non dualizable algebra um, this pre-variety does not contain um, an algebra with a super nilpotent non abelian congruence, yet is nonetheless non dualizable So, I, I guess I should say a few words about how we actually obtained these things. Um, first of all, for coming up with a dualizable algebra of non-prime power size, um, our method was to um, take a, a composite number m and take two distinct primes dividing m, p, and q, um, and expand the uh, group zp cross zq by a single unary operation, um, where our extra operation is designed in such a way to force our expansion to be two-step nilpotent yet also be a, a rich enough operation that um, we, we, get a, we, we get a very rich term structure. Um, as for this non-dualizable algebra, um, we needed to find a way to force um, non-dualizability without introducing the super nilpotent non-abelian congruence um, in any subalgebra of the power of our algebra. Um, so the idea we came up with was to consider a localization of our algebra. So what I mean by localization is start with an algebra A and an idempotent unary term operation E of A. Um, the localization of A by the operation E is going to have underlying set equal to the image of E. 
and it's going to be equipped with restrictions of term operations from A composed with E. It turns out that this localization process preserves dualizability. Um, so if A is a finite algebra with an eigenvalue unary term operation E, if A is dualizable, then E of A is dualizable. Um, this was useful for us because localizations often are independent of substructures. Even though we're defining an algebra on a subset, it's usually not, um, or, or it's often not a substructure. So there's not much risk in um, introducing supernovum and not abuseless not abuseless this to the pre variety. Still needs to be checked, but in theory. Um, or, or at least that was the motivating idea. All right, so we design an algebra with um, a super no potent non abelian localization, conclude that localization is non dualizable, and then obtain that our original algebra is non dualizable. Um, before we move on, something interesting about this um, preservation result is that. Dualizability is actually a, a fairly fragile um, property. We know that dualizability is not preserved under the formation of homomorphic images, substructures, powers, um, or, or products, and it's also not preserved under expansion by constant operations. So a lot of common constructions do not preserve dualizability, but it turns out that localization does. All right, so that's our, our connection between localization and dualizability. Um, the title has three topics, and I tried to at least talk about each pair of topics. Um, so I also wanted to talk about localization in the higher commutator. Um, it's natural to ask um, when we go through this localization process, how does supernovum come into play? Um, how is the higher commutator affected? by localization. So for that purpose, I want to denote two things. Um, given an algebra A and a set of pairs alpha from A, I'll use alpha lower script star um, to be the restriction of alpha to the localization E of A, and I'll use alpha upper star to be the congruence of A generated by that set of pairs. It turns out that for any Maltz of algebra with an idempotent unary term operation whose image generates the algebra, there is a very close connection between computation of the higher commutator in the localization and computation of the higher commutator in the original algebra. Um, so take any congruences, congruences alpha 1 through alpha n in the localization E of A, then to compute their higher commutator, um, you actually just need to let these local congruences generate congruences in the original algebra, compute the higher commutator there, and then restrict the result back to the localization. Um, and this actually limits our technique for producing non dualizable algebras without introducing um, supernovum to some other class of algebras. Um, so a, a related question to the question I posed before is whether something stronger is equivalent to um, dualizability for finite no potent algebras. Um, we want to know if dualizability is equivalent to an absence of super no potent non abelian congruences in the variety generated by our algebra instead of just in the pre variety generated by our algebra. Um, and we use localization to give a, a negative answer to the um, pre-variety version of this problem. Um, but due to the connection between um, the higher commutator in a localization and the higher commutator in the original algebra, um, it turns out that if A is to be a, a counterexample to this, or if A is to provide a negative answer to this problem, 
um, then it, it won't be produced with the same localization trick. Um, it turns out that if A is a non dualizable no limit algebra and a covenant's modular variety, and no algebra in HSP they has a super no potent non dualizable congruence, then neither does any localization um, of A. So this is still open, and we'll need to use some other technique. Um, that's all I have. Thank you for listening. dualizability is only defined for finite algebras. <laughs> um, for a, a more serious answer, um, I'm, I'm not sure about the general case. Um, just because I, I study finite algebras. Um, what I can say is that if you have a, a representable, if you have a dual adjunction between concrete categories, so that the functors are representable, um, then the representing objects will have a bijection between their underlying sets. So even for infinite structures, you do expect some sort of um, alter ego to, to be in play, um, but I'm, I'm not sure beyond that.